about the complex orbitalism. Sorry, um, I've drawn here some examples of two morphisms in that two category. But before telling you about those, let me tell you about usual bordisms. And uh, let me draw one. So we have a closed manifold on one side and a closed manifold on the other side. And between them, we have um, a Riemann surface with boundary. And if I want to define that formally, then I will use the language of ring spaces. Complex homorphism is a ring space. And it's either a locally for a point in the bulk isomorphic to the complex plane with its usual sheep of holomorphic functions, or for a point on the boundary isomorphic to the closed upper half plane, which I'm denoting H. And uh, we want that together with the decomposition of the boundary. So this is the boundary which is decomposed here in things that are in and things that are outgoing. So I told you what the sheaf that I use on the complex plane is, holomorphic functions. How about the closed upper half plane? Um, so there are a couple of equivalent ways of talking about uh, the sheaf on H that I want to put. But the fact that they're equivalent is a bit of a technical lemma. So let me just write it here for you. So one description of the sheaf is as the sheaf of continuous functions holomorphic on the open um, upper half plane and smooth along the real axis. That's description number one. Descri description number two says that I'm looking at functions that um, admit an extension to some open that is open in the complex plane, and so, um, which is smooth and um, holomorphic um, on the, uh, once again, uh, open upper half plane. And this sheaf is not the restriction of the sheaf of holomorphic functions to the um, closed upper half plane. Um, that would be the sheaf of functions that admit a little um, extension, uh, which remains holomorphic uh, to some open neighborhood of H. And so uh, the question arises of why do, you use, do I use this sheaf as opposed to uh, uh, the other one? So if I had used the sheaf, uh, which is the restriction of the structure sheaf on C to the closed upper half plane, um, by the existence of uh, analytic continuations, that's essentially the same thing as saying that these complex hypothesis, I want to view them as having some kind of um, little color that extends past on one side and the other. Um, and moreover, because um, my model space is still the upper half plane and the real axis is analytically embedded inside um, C, um, we would also have 
the inclusion of the boundary inside sigma, inside this thing, um, is analytic. And so the question is, uh, why not? And the answer has to do with these kinds of pictures up there. So if you look at them, here we have a typical thing that can happen is that they have two one manifolds that agree identically and then diverge. And clearly, that's the kind of thing which is incompatible with these lines being analytically embedded inside uh, something um, inside the Riemann surface. That's because to allow this, um, Um, it's okay to ask for the boundary to be smoothly embedded, but analytic is just too much. It will not allow for these kinds of pictures, and we need these pictures in order to eventually uh, get a two category. Composition of cobordisms. Which, um, also goes by the name conformal welding. Um, using the language of ring spaces is um, really very easy. Um, so here I have uh, sigma one, sigma two, uh, there's a chosen diffeomorphism between the um, outgoing boundary of sigma one and the incoming boundary of sigma two. So call that boundary S. So there's a chosen inclusion of S into sigma one and of S into sigma two. Then this is just um, the pushout in the category of ring spaces. Um, and um, there's a theorem, proposition, fifty gram Siegel, which says that um, this construction um, provides once again uh, an example of a, co a complex support. And moreover, so if you think about this, there's a there's a curve here which is where S goes, and that curve is smoothly embedded. Now, what does it mean to take a push out in ring spaces? Um, well, first of all, you take the usual push out of top topological spaces, i.e. you take the digit union of these two and identify the copy of S here with a copy of S there. And then um, this space here uh, comes with a notion of what it means for a function to be um, continuous, uh, smooth on this curve and holomorphic here and holomorphic there. And so really for this description, uh, 
you should really focus on this uh, first way of thinking about this, this uh, sheaf of functions. And uh, by this uh, little lemma up there that I have written for you, this is really the same thing as just being um, holomorphic across this uh, smoothly embedded curve. So that's enough for um, the usual uh, coborism one category. Let me go now pass to the coborism two category. So let me tell you about general two morphisms in that two category. And uh, I will define them by giving you the local models and then say everything that looks locally like one of these, that's acceptable. So suppose that I'm given two functions, f and g, from R to R, um, smooth. And one is smaller than the other. So if I draw the graph, say uh, this is the graph of F, and that's the graph of G. And what I care about is the part that's in between. And I'm going to call that x sub fg. So that's the formal definition is it's a set of x plus i y such that it's between the graph of F and the graph of G. And then uh, I have uh, another local model, which is um, essentially the same thing, except now uh, my function is going to be defined my functions are going to be defined um, from the positives to R um, and uh, X F G is going to be the very same thing, but now uh, I'm going to have a further condition. So the, the, the picture is now going to be something like that. Uh, but then we have this extra condition about the, the derivatives agreeing for the graphs of f and of g at this special point here where, where things stop. So the kth derivative of f is the same as the kth derivative of g at the point zero for all k. And then of course, one of them is declared to be the incoming boundary and the other one is declared to be the outgoing boundary. Yeah. The sheaf of functions on X, F, G is given as in item one of the technical lemma by um, those functions that are continuous, holomorphic on the interior and smooth on the boundary. And I can now tell you what the full complex comparison two category is. So uh, morally, its objects are points or units of points. Um, given a bunch of points on one side and a bunch of points on the other side, a one morphism is going to be a one-dimensional manifold whose boundary is the union of this and that. So a one-dimensional cobordism between these points and those points, so something that goes in between. And then the two morphisms are going to be uh, these uh, Riemann surfaces with boundary and with cusps as described here, in which I also had a bunch of examples at the beginning. 
But if you think about it, if I want to be able to glue a one manifold to another one manifold along one point, and I want to make sure that the resulting thing is a smooth one manifold, so I don't have anything like conformal welding for gluing one manifolds. And so it's going to be very important for these points to somehow capture the information of all these derivatives in order to allow for, for gluing. And, um, and therefore, the objects are going to be modeled as ring spaces. Um, which are isomorphic to uh, a finite union of the following ring space as a point, and then the ring associated to that point is the power series. Um, in one variable. So there are points, but there are points with this interesting ring. Uh, the one morphisms are going to, again, be um, um, compact ring spaces. Um, Um, which are now uh, locally isomorphic to um, the usual sheaf of C infinity functions on R or possibly on um, some interval. And finally, the morphisms are. Um, Compact ring spaces, locally isomorphic to um, one of these um, spaces, like this one or like that one. And of course, I should also allow here for the other case. And the beauty of this setup is that in all cases, um, composition is given by um, push out of ring spaces. So whether uh, I'm composing to one manifold along a point or whether I'm composing two of these things, one like that and the other one, again, along a point, or two of these along a line, it's always composition of ring spaces. And um, of course, there's a statement that's implicit here, which is that uh, performing this composition produces something which, again, falls in that same um, class of objects. And it is for this, a type of uh, verification that is very useful to use this first characterization of this of the ring of smooth functions, which, by the way, this technical lemma, as stated, um, also works uh, for these things. Um, and so this is really um, the technical heart that makes this whole um, this whole thing work. Um, now, this is very specific to this um, two-dimensional setup with this particular type of geometry, namely a complex structure. Um, but there is also something else one can do that works in complete generality in any dimension for any type of geometric structure, uh, which is to um, equip um, all the lower dimensional manifolds with germs of the top dimensional geometry. 
So um, the question is, um, why not define the objects to be points together with a germ of Riemann surface against around this point and define the one morphisms as being things again with a germ um, uh, around them and then the cobordisms again with a little germ around. So that's a, a very completely viable thing that we could have done. And the question is, why not? And uh, this comes from our desire that the set of one morphisms be classifiable in an easy way. So for example, I want there to be just one circle. So if I have a circle, S1, so a closed one manifold, so that's just locally with its sheaf of C infinity functions, there's only one such thing. And that's good. Um, but if I consider this variant where I have a little germ of um, complex manifold around it, then there's very many of them. For example, uh, there's one which is the one where the circle is analytically embedded, but there's very many where the circle is just C infinity embedded, but not analytically. And, um, and so that's a, an unpleasant feature of this way of setting up things. Uh, and that's why um, we prefer this. Something I should probably have told you um, earlier from the beginning is that this whole investigation of the complex comparison two category is uh, motivated and guided by um, my work in progress with James Tanner, whose goal is to construct uh, chiral conformal field theories in the axiomatic setup set up by Graham Siegel. So let me tell you a little bit um, what those are. They are functors from the non-extended version of this, so the thing that only contains one manifold and two manifolds, to the two category of concrete linear categories. Let me tell you what those are. Concretely in our category, concretely in our category um, is a um, linear category. Um, equipped with a faithful functor um, down to the category of Hilbert spaces. So um, think of it as the category of unitary representations of a group. So you have the category, but then you can also, given a representation, forget the action and you just get the underlying vector space or the category of actions of, of representations of, of an algebra, again, with an underlying vector space. And uh, there is a notion of functor between such things. So if I have C1 and C2, two concrete categories, both of them equipped with a forgetful functor to Hilbert spaces, then the concrete functor is a functor, a linear functor, so linear on all home spaces, 
together with a two morphism. Um, let me call it Z. That's a usual letter I'll be using for that. And I should say that this one is uh, typically not an isomorphism. And um, a good example of this situation to keep in mind is the situation of um, when I have a group and a subgroup. So G1 sits inside G2, two groups, then I can induce a G1 representation to a G2 representation. And I get a functor from rep G1 to rep G2. This functor does not commute with the operation of taking the underlying Hilbert space or vector space. Um, but if I start with a representation of G1, call it V, and let's call W the induced representation, then what we do have is a linear map from V to W. There's always a map from the representation to the thing after it's being induced. And that is exactly this natural transformation uh, that I've been calling Z here. Now let me finish this definition. Uh, there's um, two further conditions that I need to impose. First of all, uh, these um, concrete functors that we assign to a um, complex towards them, sigma, um, the, the functor part of the concrete functor needs to depend in a way that's locally constant in terms of sigma. So really it only depends on the topology of sigma. And then uh, this um, natural transformation Z in the middle is to depend holomorphically on sigma. Uh, so this is still a bit of a lie. This is not completely locally constant. So there's an anomaly here that I'm suppressing. And uh, here, in order to formulate this holomorphicity condition, I would need to uh, say in what way the set of of morphisms, so the set of cobordisms between two one-dimensional manifolds is itself a, a complex manifold, an infinite-dimensional complex manifold. Um, so anyway, so this is the idea of the definition. This is not the full definition. Uh, just so that you get a feeling for what chiral conformal field theories are, let me tell you about one very important class of examples, those so-called chiral WCW models. And they depend on um, a choice of compact league group. Which I will take to be uh, simple and simply connected uh, together with a natural number called the level. So given a one manifold S, circle or a disjunction of circles, the meta um, assigns to that the category of representations of the infinite dimensional Lie group of maps from S into G. And this group needs to be actually uh, centrally extended, and the central extension depends on the level K, but I'm suppressing that from the notation. And an equivalent way of um, describing this is by using the complexification of G. So I can write this as representations of the space of maps from S into GC, the complexification. That's now a complex infinite dimensional Lie group, and we should be looking at holomorphic representations. And I should probably say that. Um, these chiral WCW models um, are among the CFTs that have not yet been constructed. And so the story that I'm telling you is full of um, problems uh, of technical nature that have not been resolved. And I just want to flag one of them. Um, if I have a Hilbert space on which this group map SG acts, then the complexified Lie group um, will only act by unbounded operators on that same Hilbert space. And so that causes lots of headaches, um, but 
Here I'm just telling you the, the general story or, or how it should go. Um, and uh, given a complex organism, now I can have I can look at the um, one part of the boundary, the incoming boundary, the outgoing boundary, or the whole thing, and I can look at the group of maps from um, the incoming boundary into GC, the outgoing boundary into GC, or the whole sigma into GC, and then I look at holomorphic maps, and there is obvious restriction group homomorphisms going this way and that way. And at the level of representation categories, if I have a representation of that, I can put it back to representation of this thing, and then I can induce the representation along uh, of this group along this map. And um, one big stumbling block of this approach is that if you perform this induction, uh, so if I start with some H that lives in here, and I look at F of H, so F sigma, because it depends on the coborism sigma that lives here, then um, it is not quite clear how to make that into, um, into Hilbert space, um, specifically um, how to equip it with an inner product. And uh, Grand Singer believed that this, this should be possible, but um, was never able to actually uh, write down such an inner product. So as I said with um, James Teller, um, we've been working on a program of trying to construct chiral conformal field theories, including this one, and we believe that we have the tools that would allow us to do it. And um, one of the features of our approach is that uh, it, we, we construct or we have to construct a fully extended thing. So that assigns values to not just um, two-dimensional and one-dimensional manifolds, but also to points, which is why I talked about the uh, complex suborism two category at the beginning. And uh, another feature is that um, it made us notice a certain anomaly, which we believe um, people had not noticed before, um, which is that when you when you construct this this vector space, uh, it comes not with one Hilbert space structure, but it comes with a family of Hilbert space structures. Um, so a family of norms, each one differing from the other ones by rescaling, um, and there is no canonical way of picking one such norm. So this vector space is a Hilbert space, but in more than one way, and there's no way of choosing one in a canonical way. Um, but but they, they just these these different Hilbert space norms just differ by a complex by, by a positive scale. So what we claim is that associated to every To every two morphism, um, i.e., a Riemann surface with boundary and possibly also with cusps, there is a certain um, R plus torsor. Um, let me call it uh, D sub sigma. Um, that controls the failure of this guy here. being a Hilbert space. So as soon as you pick a point in that cursor, then it becomes a Hilbert space, but before we don't know, or, and, and it is. So um, what I'm saying is that 
the the norm, which is um, the, the Hilbert space norm, and this vector space, which a priori you might want it to land inside inside the set of possible real numbers. In fact, um, that's not how it goes. Um, it lands in. Well, this thing. So um, let me tell you about how we um, how to describe this torsor. So it's going to be represented by a pair where uh, G is a Riemannian metric inside the um, conformal class. I mean, this is this comes with a with a this is a this is a complex um, curve, so it has a Riemannian metric well defined up to a function, and you sort of pick one of these Riemannian metrics in that equivalence class. Um, and, uh, and R is just a positive um, real number. All of that up to um, an equivalence relation um, where the equivalence relation is given by this specific formula where um, which tells you that if I change the metric by some function then um, I change the uh, scalar r by a specified quantity and that quantity is the exponential of the uh, Liouville action functional um, which is written in this form um, f is our function k is the scalar curvature of g and r Is the geodesic curvature um, of the boundary of sigma again with respect to G? And uh, one can verify that um, this satisfies the following co cycle condition. And so this tells us that um, this equivalence relation um, is well posed and that this is indeed going to be an R plus torsor as opposed to something that's just a single point. Um, some of the properties of these, uh, these torsors associated to uh, Riemann surfaces are that if I look at the torsor, associated to um, a surface which is obtained by gluing uh, horizontally to cobordisms. So I have here sigma one and sigma two, which I glue horizontally. And then that is canonically isomorphic to the tensor product of 
of the one for sigma one and the one for sigma two. And similarly, if I do the other type of composition, which is vertical composition, so now I have sigma one, a sigma one here, and then I glue another one on top of it. I guess I haven't been very good at my choice of colors, so let me do it like that. So. And again, this is canonically isomorphic. To d sigma one tensor d sigma two, well, by which I really mean uh, the Cartesian product of d sigma one and d sigma two modulo the diagonal action of R plus. And uh, what this implies is that um, this assignment sigma goes to d sigma, where d sigma is given by this particular prescription um, is a central extension of the two category of the complex composition two category. So I had called it Cobb zero one two confirmer um, by R plus. And moreover, by inspection, you can check that this does nothing at the level of zero morphisms and one morphisms. Um, so it's trivial on this part. Now, I should probably tell you that um, James Heather and I, we actually don't know how to compare the art forcer that uh, controls the failure of these WCW vector spaces being Hilbert spaces, and the art forcers coming from this explicit construction using the uh, Liouville action functional. So we suspect that um, they are the same, uh, or more precisely, we suspect that. Um, they are the same up to a power of the central charge. But uh, in order to be able to establish that, what we really would need, and we don't have at the moment, is a, a description and computation of the relevant cohomology group in which such uh, central extensions live. So where do such central extensions live? So let me write C as a shorthand for this um, coborism category, the extended coborism category, so has zero, one, and two dimensional manifolds. And the two manifolds are equipped to the conformal structure. And let me also introduce a couple of um, subcategories. Um, defined in the following way. So A is going to be um, having just zero and one manifolds. And of course, there's nothing conformal there, so I just put smooth. Um, but it does have two morphisms. So the morphisms are uh, diffeomorphisms of one manifolds. So if you want the two morphisms in here, are uh, those two morphisms in C 
which are isomorphic to identity to morphisms. And um, now B is going to be a thing where I relax that condition of being isomorphic to identity two morphisms, and I replace it by homotopic to identity two morphisms. So, uh, for example, a circle cross an interval is in B, but not in A. And uh, the claim is that the relevant cohomology group in which such central extensions live uh, is H3 of C relative A with coefficients in R plus. So um, why H3? Well, if you think about central extensions of groups, um, in a central extension of a group, you associate to every element of your group a torsor, namely the pre-image under the map from the central extension down to the, to the non-centrally extended group. Um, so you assign a torsor to every element of the group, and the elements of groups are one morphisms, when if you think about a group as being a single object with a bunch of one morphisms. Here, we assign torsors to two morphisms, and that boosts up the cohomological degree to um, H3. Now let me present you an attempt at computing this um, H3 group. Um, we don't know how to compute it. This is just a, a guess of how one might organize um, the computation. So first of all, we have these three guys, one inside the other, and there's a corresponding long exact sequence of relative cohomology groups of which I drew part here. The group we care about is in the middle. Um, these two are going to help us. The hope is that this should be controlled by some kind of a Lyadra cohomology. And the hope is that this would then end up being a one-dimensional thing generated by the VRSOR central extension. This, on the other hand, if you think about it, um, we have these um, complex cohomorphisms that have all this geometry, but then we're taking relative to things that are like anuli, where uh, you're allowed to um, essentially add analyze at the end at no cost. And so the hope is that uh, this should be controlled by topology. And, uh, and then there's uh, computations due to um, Galatius, Madsen, Tillman, and Weiss that tell us what the classifying spectra of uh, some of these um, categories uh, are. So let me quickly write this down. So Galatis, Madsen, Tillman, Weiss tell us that the classifying spectrum for C is um, the double suspension of CP infinity minus one. And for B, you get just a shear spectrum. And so this relative cohomology group um, is now concentrated um, in degrees um, two, four, six, and so on, which tells us that it is reasonable to expect that this vanishes. And so we have here zero maps to the thing we care about, maps to R, 
And um, moreover, we have a particular construction using the Liouville action functional of an element in here. And so the hope would be that we then perform a computation which shows us that our particular element D here, uh, which lives in here, um, has non-zero image. in here. And so if all these pieces um, are, uh, are able to be, uh, to be uh, performed, then this would show that the relevant cohomology group is isomorphic to the reals uh, generated by this class um, coming from the Liouville action functional. And so this would be wonderful because then um, whatever comes out of um, our construction with James Tanner of, for example, the WCW models, we could just be like, oh, well, it lives in the same group, which is just R. So it has to be some power of um, this uh, Liouville uh, centric extension. Mm -hmm. So any questions for Anthony? <laughs> no worries. Oh, oh, let's see. Could you say more about the Lie algebra cohomology there? Um, sure. So, um, if you So, so there is, so what was the, um, what were the things that we were looking at? We're looking at, um, so let me first sort of say the, the simplest type of, of analog and then I'll add the um, fact that it's ex extended down to points. So in the simplest way, you have um, on one side, the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle that's a subgroup of something slightly bigger, which is a group of cobordisms from the semi-group of cobordisms from the circle to itself that are uh, homotopically trivial. So things that look like S1 cross an interval with a given complex structure. That's called the semi-group of Anilai. Um, so diff S1 is a subgroup inside this bigger semi-group. Um, which is the semigroup of Anilai. And moreover, the semigroup of Anilai is a, in some sense, a complexification of diff S1. That's an observation by, by Graham Siegel. And um, so the diff S1 has a um, universal central extension where the center is the reals, and correspondingly, the semigroup of Anilai has a universal central extension whose central whose center is the complex, complexification of the reals. So it's C. And, um, and that central extension, either of the FS1 or of its complexification, is usually easy to write down in terms of at the Lie algebra level. The, the central extension of this group is really easy to write down at the Lie algebra level, and that's called the Vera Soro central extension um, um, of, of the Lie algebra of, of vector fields on the circle. Um, now, we're, um, 
so if we're looking at cohomology of the semigroup of annuli uh, of central extensions that are that are required to be holomorphic, um, then um, that would be the same. So, so holomorphic central extension of a, of a complexified group versus real central extensions of the real Lie group there in bijective correspondence. But we're not looking at holomorphic central extensions. We're looking at just real central extensions of this holomorphic semi-group. And so what you expect, the answer is C, uh, complex numbers modular real numbers. But that's all really at the Lie algebra level that, uh, that you do this computation. And then you exponentiate to make central extensions of these groups. Um, now, the so that's, so I was telling you so far only about diff S1 and its, and its complexification, but really what one wants is um, the same thing, except where you're allowed to cut the circle at various points into intervals. So a central extension of the category of of a uh, coborism category of of points and and um, one dimensional coborisms between them um, and the co-cycle that you use to define the virasora central extension mm -hmm. um, that still makes sense for that so you can sort of hope that it's some kind of Lie algebra cohomology but it's no longer just a Lie algebra because it's a it's a Lie algebra um, so for, for each one morphism, you have a corresponding Lie algebra, uh, but then you also have the horizontal composition of one morphisms. Um, this is not something that I really know how to do. This is not something that I claim that I have done. It's just an idea. Um, so I cannot really say much more, um, but if you want to start thinking about it, that, that's great. Then I would recommend that you only look at this cobordism one category, one category that has points and one manifolds, nothing else, no complex Riemann surfaces, nothing, just that. And that already should have an interesting central extension, um, which I suspect is controlled by some version of Lie algebra cohomology. But I, I, I don't have anything much more precise to say. Um, yeah, so. Um, so when way does that answer your question or because you just typed it so if you have something to say please <laughs> okay thanks um so let's see uh a bit of comments about about the about the video um sure <laughs> Uh, the video is made using what is known as a light board. So uh, light board is the, is the keyword if you want to, to Google it. Um, you'll find all kinds of stuff, um, including um, YouTube videos that tell you how you build your own light board at home if you want to, which is what I did. So this is my, I have my, my, my home light board, which I made in, um, in the summer of 2020 when everyone was was stuck at home and so i had uh, extra time to spare and i built a light board that I then used to give lectures um essentially what's going on is that there's a camera on one side and there's a, essentially a freestanding window in the middle of the room and then i stand behind the window and i write on this thing and it has moreover LED lights that shine light into this pane of glass. And then as you write with a marker, it comes out as, as bright light. So um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Mm, is this central extension of two category also related to some twisted cohomology theory or some vector bundle? Um, so, it's, um, uh, 
it's related to like um, higher twenty, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so in, in conformal field theory, there's this thing called the central charge of the conformal field theory, um, which is just a number, just a, a real number, which um, essentially tells you what is the central extension, what is the virus, what is the multiple of the virus or central extension that you use. Um, now, in terms of um, relevance, for um, twisted um, for 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 the, the type of stuff that you care about for twisted uh, cohomology theory and possibly elliptic cohomology. Um, so uh, the the idea of how to connect. Um, Elliptic cohomology, elliptic cohomology with field theories. Um, so the, this this conjectural setup, which is known as the Stoltz-Teichner conjecture, essentially says that um, classes in elliptic cohomology correspond to two-dimensional quantum field theories um, up to concordance. Um, so we're no longer talking about conformal field theories. We're talking about more general quantum field theories, i.e. we're not talking about Riemann surfaces. We're not talking about complex structures, but we're talking about Riemannian structures on, on, these, on, these, um, on these surfaces. Um, but there is um, something that people have been calling a uh, gravitational anomaly. So you can look at quantum field theories with a given gravitational anomaly. And those are supposed to correspond to um, elliptic cohomology, either of a given degree or, um, or possibly if you're doing it over some space, like with a given twist. Um, and, um, and there is a strong relationship between the central charge in conformal field theory and the gravitational anomaly. Um, in some sense, um, they are, um, well, they are, they are very much related uh, in the sense that uh, the, there is a, a, a simplest existing conformal field theory called the free fermion conformal field theory and uh, you define gravitational anomaly to mean if you tensor with that, then the anomaly goes away, like with an appropriate power of it. So essentially it's saying the, the, a, a QFT has a gravitational anomaly n if, I, if upon tensoring with n copies of the free fermion, the, the anomaly goes away. So it's, it's related, it's a little bit of a, of a story to actually spell out the relation, I, I hope I, I made justice to that story in the in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for um, for having me here and for allowing me to give this this presentation in this format. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, in fact. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I think if there's no more questions for Professor Henry Enriquez, this is the end of the first day of the conference. Now, thank you for your participation. I hope you all have enjoyed today's conference. So the first talk tomorrow will start on 8 a.m. And I hope to see you again. Okay. Thank you.